characteristics. I could actually go above 20 if I wanted to stretch it. But there are at least 14 essential characteristics in these last days that are going to distinguish the shrinking majority from the growing remnant. 14 characteristics. Some of them are already apparent, at least to a degree. Some of them are already uh, apparent to a conspicuous degree, but they'll all become more and more apparent as we get closer to the return of the Lord. The scriptures will be known to you, but it's important that we have a mental outline to understand the essential characteristics that are going to separate what ultimately will be the apostate church from the faithful bride of Christ ready for his return. First one. How many of you remember a tape we did several years ago called The Plastic Bible? Remember? And we did Logos Plastios. That's what it actually says in Greek. And in the book, Shadows of the Beast, we also talk about the pseudo-logon, that every cult, every false religion has another word of God, which is not the real word of God, but they pretend it is. The first characteristic that is going to distinguish increasingly the bride, the true bride, the faithful bride, from what will become conspicuously, axiomatically, the harlot church. Now remember, by the harlot church, we're no longer simply talking about the World Council of Churches or Rome or cults. We're talking about much of mainstream evangelicism as it has been. 25 years ago, I couldn't fathom saying that. And then yesterday, I read that and read to you that A.W. Tozer said it 50 years ago. <laughs> Those who have the logos will be the remnant. Those that will have the logos plastios. Now in Greek, the word order doesn't matter. It goes by case ending. You can put the adjective before the noun or vice versa. It doesn't matter. The logos or the plastios logos. The plastic Bible. There is a reason. You see the popularity of things like Eugene Peterson's The Message. You see the popularity of Bibles that are paraphrases, but not only paraphrases, bad ones. And not only bad ones, but like the message, not only worse ones. <laughs> you got the bad ones, you got the worse ones, but then you have ones that are not even scripture. But people treat it as if it is. There are major, major passages in the message by Eugene Peterson as the most popular example, but it's not the only one. You've got the same thing in some of these inclusive translations that are so remote from the original Greek and Hebrew that they're not the word of God. But people are reading them as if they are. There's a reason why the message is, is uh, Rick Warren's people's Bible of choice. It's because so much of what he teaches is not scriptural, so he has to find something that, <laughs> that he can base it on. Major sections of the message, and of some of these inclusive versions, these inclusive versions 
Take out anything speaking about homosexuality. Take out anything distinguishing males from females, because I want to include the feminists. Take out anything that condemns other religions or other gods as false, because they, <laughs> they want it to be inclusive for all, all faiths and all whatever. So remote from the original meaning of the original text that it's not the word of God. But you'll find increasingly people professing to be evangelicals reading those mistranslations. Now again, we always go back to Nehemiah 8.8. 8. There's only one verse in the Word of God, 32,000 verses, 66 books. There's only one verse in the entirety of Scripture that speaks to the issue of translation, and that is Nehemiah 8.8. 8. It's the only one. God only saw a need to mention the issue of translation one time. And it's just common sense what it says. The priority is on the original meaning of the original language. Nehemiah 8.8. 8. God only saw a need to put one verse in the entirety of Scripture, saying that's the priority. We've had lunatic fringe King James-only extremists, the Ruckmanites lifting up the King James over the original Greek and Hebrew. He actually does that. Ruckman goes so far as to say it additions, not editions, but additions, in the 1611 edition of the King James, additions in the 1611 edition that are not found in the original Greek and Hebrew or further revelation. <laughs> Adding to the Word of God. That's how far he would go with it. I'm not saying all King James only people go that far, but he, he, he certainly does. You've always had people who did this. You had people who would change certain things, like Jehovah's Witnesses with their New World Translation. Add an indefinite article. The word was a god when it's not in the Greek language, let alone text. But it's gotten to the point now where you have supposedly evangelical Christians and churches going beyond that, reading something that's not even a paraphrase, but basically another book that says something completely different than what the original, by any stretch of the imagination, says or means to say. It's crazy. You've all heard me talk about that the one time I picked up the message and I read John chapter 1 in the Greek and it was unbelievable. The word became flesh and moved into our neighborhood. Unbelievable. No, it's katiskenod, tabernacled among us. The same God that was in the Shekinah would become incarnate. He moved into our neighborhood. No relationship. Now let me tell you something, and I say this in love. David Stern's a friend of mine. I like David. He wrote a book that's worth reading called Restoring the Jewishness of the Gospel. His Jewish New Testament, it is a very bad paraphrase. But because it looks Jewish to people, they think it's kosher. <laughs> I got to tell you, it isn't. It isn't. Now, he's written other things that are good. I'm not saying he's a bad person or a nefarious figure or anything like that. He's a friend of mine. I like the guy. But it's a, it's, it's a bad translation. It's, not, it's just bad. You're going to see this increasingly. When the Word of God does not say what they like, when it does not agree with them, they're going to go find one where they can make it seem to agree with them or justify it on the basis of it. Secondly, the second characteristic that is going to separate the two, and never the twain shall meet, as David Hawking cited earlier, rightly dividing the Word of God, or we translate it handling, but the original is dividing.
exegesis. Taking out of it that which it actually states. The growing remnant will take out of the Word of God that which it actually states. What will become the harlot church, the shrinking majority, the evangelical mainstream, will increasingly gravitate towards Jesus. Reading something into the text that it doesn't actually say. Now this takes various forms. In its worst form it becomes Gnostic. A text is spiritualized out of context. That's at its grossest, most ugly, and usually most damaging. But it's not the only way. People do it other ways. What they do is something, a message that we're teaching now, decaemi and gnomain, elevating their own opinion to the status of doctrine. Now, that's a teaching that I've done in Nottingham just here in Alpherton a few weeks ago, and we'll be doing it again at Hepzibah and some other places. When you see people reading into the text that which it doesn't say, there are certain ways, again, this happens. The obvious is, again, Gnosticism. But then there's something else called Conscientiousization. That's what they call it. It was invented by people, left-wing Roman Catholics in South America, who were basically Marxist, and copied by Protestant liberation theologians, mainly in Africa, Desmond Tutu's people. What a word. Conscientiousization. You first formulate what it is you want to propound. You don't begin with what the text says. You begin with what you want it to say. This is usually expressed in two forms one of which is conscientiousization. Because they were trying to overthrow the governments of Latin American countries and of African countries, they said the central event of Scripture is not the gospel of salvation of Jesus dying and raising from the dead and his promise to return. The central event is the exodus because it was a national liberation of a people. <laughs> that was their doctrine. So Christianity simply becomes a political gospel, which is simply giving a religious expression of purely human design to a political ideology, cause, or philosophy. But then there's the more common form. That's what happens in the third world, mainly Latin America and Africa. When it happens in Great Britain, or America, or Canada, or Australia, or Europe, or something, it is proof texting. Proof texting. These are the two forms. So you have Gnosticism, that's obvious. 
conscientization, but then proof texting. The master of proof texting on a popular level is again Mr. Warren's people. You don't begin with what the scripture says about an issue. You begin with what you say about an issue. And then you go try to find a text to support it. <laughs> when you can't find a text to support it, you find the text you can take out of context to support it. So you go to Jesus. But when you can't find the text to take out of context, where you can read something into the text that doesn't say when you can't do that, then you go find Ecclesios Logos. <laughs> go get a copy of the message. You can make that say anything. <laughs> Christianity becomes rewritten. Redefined. Now we deal with this in a, in a prophetic and historical analysis in the book, The uh, Dilemma of Laodicea. Third thing that happens. The faithful church, the growing remnant, will look at what Jesus said, spirit and truth. We will worship in spirit and in truth. A proper emphasis on the ministry and person of the Holy Spirit, his intercessory role, and his illuminating role in our study of the scripture which brings us to the truth, the sword of the spirit. You'll have a balance of spirit and truth. the shrinking majority will emphasize either one or the other. The charismatic ones will go into the era of neo-Montanism. That's the theological term, something I colloquially refer to, borrowing the term Chuck Smith used, charismania. Oh, the letter killeth, the spirit giveth life, we're free in the spirit. They don't even know what they're talking about. That's not what the letter killeth, spirit giveth life even means. But the, you know, we're, the spirit, I just feel in my heart the spirit showed me we have the spirit this is not new this is the lunacy upon which the Quakers were built this goes back to the Quakers in the 17th century but it goes back to the Montanists in the 3rd century 4th century Those who emphasize the spirit to the negation of truth will wind up with a counterfeit spirit. The Holy Spirit will be counterfeited. When you have experiential theology and the people are seeking the Holy Spirit without a biblical foundation, without a doctrinal compass, without a scriptural logos premise, they're not going to get the Holy Spirit, they're going to get a counterfeit spirit. They're going to be deluded. That's like this stupid, ridiculous Elam garbage you have now in Wales, just more of the same old nonsense they had with Toronto and Pensacola, but they're just too ignorant to know it and too spiritually deluded. And it's, they're so ignorant that they think it's a revival, like, like Evan Roberts. Well, it's not going to be a revival like Evan Roberts. But then there's the ones who emphasize truth to the negation of the spirit.
these will go into cessationism. In reaction to the lunacy of the charismaniacs, there has been a growth of Calvinistic cessationists in the last 10 to 12 years. You're seeing people going to those kind of churches thinking that they are more biblically based and more solid. Throwing the proverbial baby out with the bathwater, you toss out both. And they think that's safe and that's more solid, they think. But it isn't. If you try to pursue truth without the illumination of the Holy Spirit, you're going to end in just as much error. Look at that now spiritually and theologically deranged false teacher, John MacArthur. Anti-charismatic, anti-Pentecostal, against the whole thing, it's all of the devil, not of God. But he's teaching people, you can take the mark of the beast and worship the Antichrist and still get saved. He's just as crazy and as sick, if not more so, as what he's against. Their minds and their spirits are just as polluted as the charismaniacs. What a ridiculous, outrageous, and dangerous thing to teach people. And his father was like, Phil Johnson are defending the indefensible. Now, I've known countless lunatic fringe Pentecostals. I've known them in Australia. I've known them in South Africa. I've known them in America. I've known them in Britain. I've known them everywhere. No shortage. <coughs> but to say you can take the mark of the beast and worship the Antichrist and still get saved, even they're not that nuts. <laughs> John MacArthur's that nuts. That man's lost his marbles. Jimmy D. Young, another one. They're teaching very serious, very dangerous, fundamental error. They're as crazy as what they're against, if not more so. You pursue the spirit without the truth, you're going to wind up in neo-Montanism. You pursue the truth without the spirit, you're going to wind up in cessationism. Both of them will result in doctrinal error, serious, destructive doctrinal error. It's like Hitler and Stalin. They ostensibly claim to be at opposite poles of the ideological spectrum. In fact, there were six of one, half dozen of the other. Fourth, the growing remnant church will understand the prophetic purposes of God for Israel and the Jews. The shrinking majority will increasingly, increasingly gravitate towards replacement theology, supersessionism, if they're not that already. You've got these moves afoot with false teachers and I would say pseudo-academic frauds like Gary Burge and Colin Chapman, not to mention, of course, Mr. Sizer, who are trying to mobilize evangelicals to oppose Israel. At their Christ at the Czech Post conference, Chapman was asked, 
Now remember, Chapman was from Trinity College, Bristol. He claimed to be, claims to be evangelical, same as Burge. Chapman was asked a question. What would you say about the human rights abuses in Israel relative to what's happening in the countries that surround it to Christians? His response, I refuse to answer that question because I know where it comes from. In other words, he knows what happens to Christians in Muslim countries, but he doesn't want to say anything about it, even though the Israelis don't persecute Christians that way, and the people around it do, he's on the side of the people who are against Israel who surround it. A completely detestable, stinking, worthless hypocrite. True Anglican, though. Gary Burge, what is this Israel and the Jews? I thought Paul and Jesus put an end to that. Come and debate me, Gary Burge. You are a pseudo-academic fraud, and I can prove it from the Greek text. You want to debate? Just get a camera, and I'll be there. You bigoted phony. The best thing Wheaton College can do for the cause of Christ is burn to the ground. Billy Graham's alma mater. Israel is going to increasingly be an issue of division between the harlot church and the bride. It's four. Five. The growing remnant will have unity of the spirit. I have explained this before. One faith, one baptism. When Christians and congregations have one faith, one baptism. When they are spiritually and doctrinally united, they don't need or want to be an institution. They will organize on the basis of practicality only. Together we can have a missions program or build a Bible college or build a hospital in the third world or something like that. They will organize for basis on the basis of practicality in things like mission. But they will not need to centralize, hierarchicalize, or denominationalize. Once the unity of the spirit goes, once they begin to fragment doctrinally, they will denominationalize, they will centralize, and become more hierarchical and theocratic, led by religious theocrats, not by the Holy Spirit. They're no longer held together by the Holy Spirit. They no longer have a common doctrine, so they try to augment, supplement, and ultimately replace that by a man-made institutionalization of the churches. So you have a denomination. What is a denomination? Might have begun as a movement of independent churches. Assemblies of God began as a movement of independent churches. Baptists began as a movement of independent churches. What happens once they become a denomination? Perhaps you've heard me say it. What is a denomination? It's not one faith, one baptism. I recall when I opposed the Baptist Union of Great Britain signing evangelicals and Catholics together, and I got into a tussle with Douglas McBain, soon to have become president of the Baptist Union, at that time president of the Baptist Association of London. And we went at it. And I said to him, this goes against the Baptist heritage. He said, what heritage? I said, Spurgeon, Bunyan. He said, well, they all disagreed with each other, didn't they? 
I said, not about Roman Catholicism. You want some quotes? He wouldn't deal with it. His argument, why the Baptist should go into ecumenical union with Rome? Well, we have Baptists who are theologically liberal. The Roman Catholic Church believes in the historicity of the resurrection. They believe in the actuality of the virgin birth. But since we have Baptists who don't believe it, why shouldn't we unite with Rome? That was his argument. We should unite with the Church of Rome that says you're saved by sacraments instead of second birth, that you atone for your own sin in purgatory instead of the blood of Christ cleansing from all sin. We should unite with them because we have Baptists already who we're united with who are bigger heretics than they are. That was his argument. And his predecessor, Bernard Green, was as bad as he was. I got nowhere, but I tried. But they got nowhere. Didn't expect to. So what do you have? You have a denomination. What is a denomination? It is a tax-exempt property trust and a superannuation retirement fund for ministers. <laughs> With the cross on the roof. That's what a denomination is. A tax-exempt property trust and a superannuation retirement fund for their ministers. Not held together by one faith, one baptism. They are held together by considerations of theocratic politics, finance, and administration. But that's only the beginning. <laughs> then they begin uniting with other denominations. But that's only the beginning. Along comes Rick Warren, and now they're uniting with other religions who worship other gods. ecumenical and interfaith agenda. The road to Babylon from which there are no exits. Once you're on that road, you either make a U-turn, which becomes politically and financially costly to do, and socially stigmatizing to do, or else you just stay on that road because there are no exits. Look at Galatians chapter 1, please. Verse 8, verse 9. But even though we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we've preached to you, let him be accursed. As we've said before, so I say now again, if any man is preaching to you a gospel Contrary to the one you have received, let him be anathema. The growing remnant will hold to the gospel of propitiation.
God becomes a man to take our sin. He who knew no sin became sin to atone for ours in order to give us his righteousness, the just for the unjust. Paul says, if Paul preaches a different gospel, let Paul be accursed. If an angel appears and preaches a different gospel, let him be accursed. Again, you've got Britain's number one youth minister, Mr. Chalk, saying if that is the gospel, God is, a, is the quintessential cosmic child abuser. You've got the author of The Shack, William B. Young, denying it. Two weeks ago, had a mother with teenagers contact me. Concerned about what her children were getting in their youth group from church from the so-called ministry of Steve Chalk. She contacted the pastor. The pastor gave her a note, which she transcribed and forwarded on to me by email. This was after Mr. Chalk, of course, endorsed same-sex marriage and began teaching the Christian youth of Britain to endorse same-sex marriage. The first words out of the pastor's pen, or whatever he did, first of all, I want to assure you Steve Chalk is a brother in Christ. No, he isn't. If he ever was, he's not now. He denies the master who fought him. What does it say in Peter? Even denying the master who fought him. He didn't buy me. He didn't die in my place. They're no different than Rome. They're no different than Jehovah's Witness. They're no different than Mormons. They're no better than theological liberals. They have, that is, the shrinking majority will subscribe to another gospel. At seven. When you see another gospel, be on the lookout for another Christ. To the faithful church, to the bride, waiting for the bridegroom to the growing remnant. Jesus, the Logos incarnate, is the monogenes. He's the uncompromising monogenes, the only begotten of the Father. To the Mormons, he is the spirit brother of Satan. How can he be both the monogenes and the brother of the devil? If he has a brother who is the devil, he obviously is not the only begotten. He might be a genes, but not a monogenes. What do you do when Ravi Zacharias speaks in Mormon temples and pre-agrees before he speaks to Mormons? 
not to say anything about their Jesus versus the real one and pre-agrees to behave and speak as if they're the same Jesus. Oh, Ravi Zacharias! He's a real champion of the faith for the shrinking majority. Oh, but God has used him! Yeah, God did use him. God used King Joash and King Jehu, too. In the beginning, God used King Saul. They compromise with another Christ. When you see another gospel, you only have to do is compromise with another gospel. You understand? Once you compromise with it, you'll take it on board in some fashion or to some degree. Another Christ is going to follow. The harbinger of this, in many ways, was the late John Wimber. That deceiver who brought the Kansas City false prophets like the homosexual drunk Paul Cain to Britain said, taught, we're going to take the gospel out of the language of the courtroom and put it into the language of the family drawing room. Instead of God as an angry judge, we're going to have him as a loving father, as if the two were mutually exclusive. The fact of the matter is, Isaiah... Paul, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were all directly inspired by the Holy Spirit to put the gospel into the language of a judicial proceeding where Jesus Christ was put on trial for what I did. He was put on trial in my place. He was put on trial in your place. We should have been on trial. The only difference is we were actually guilty of what he was falsely accused of. You can't know God as a loving father unless you know him as an angry judge who hates sin. And then he gets in bed with Rome and Catholicism. Another Christ. If anybody says he's in the inner rooms, don't go there. Anybody says he's in the wilderness, don't go there. I love Brian Gemmel. But what he's teaching is not only scriptural, it is exactly what Jesus warned against. That Christ is going to come back physically before the rapture? Don't believe it. And don't believe anybody who tells you he's coming back as transubstantiated bread and wine. Bread and wine is Jesus Christ? You worship bread and wine as Christ incarnate? When you see another gospel, look out. Another Christ is coming right after it. Faithful church, the growing remnant will believe in moral absolutes.
Let me find the gorgeous broad. <laughs> Nothing personal, Sean, man. I'm only picking on you because you're the best looking girl in the room. <laughs> I can like her as a friend. I could love her as a sister. But the second I lust after her or anybody else I am not married to, that is something that cost Jesus Christ his life. I'm sorry, the Lord made you beautiful. <laughs> I'm sorry you're not ugly. <laughs> it's absolute. That's it. You want somebody messing around with your kid's sister or your daughter? No. But don't mess around with somebody else's kid's sister or their daughter. End the story. It's absolute. If God says it's wrong, it's always been wrong. That's always going to be wrong. Save that sexual energy for the person you marry in Christ who is joined together. Absolute. Homosexuality. It's always been wrong and always will be, no matter what Tony Campola and Steve Chalk are saying. No. The shrinking majority go into moral relativism. That was for them. God made me this way. No, he didn't. How many medical doctors we have here with us? One, two, three. Please correct me if I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, please stop me. Stop me if I'm wrong. When I was in university, I was taught the intestinal linings come by epithelium, single strata, highly absorptive tissue. Sphinctoria muscles do not have concave, convex function, functionality. And that kind of tissue is not designed to facilitate penetration. It is entirely different than the vaginal epithelium. It is medically dangerous to engage in sodomy, particularly if you make it your norm. The tissue rips easily. It's easy to see why these people are thousands of times statistically more predisposed to HIV infection. God knows what else. Certain kind of cancers that mainly only they get, like Carposi sarcoma. It is medically verifiable as not natural. And I'm certainly not a Darwinist. But if I was, I would have to say it is a congenital birth defect if you were born that way because it's non-reproductive. Darwinism teaches survival of the fittest. <laughs> now, I'm not a Darwinist, but if I was, you have a birth defect if you think you were born that way. Scientifically, medically, nobody can deny these things. What it says in Romans 1, it's undeniable. Look at the biostatics, the reduced longevity. Oh, it's all relative. What, the intestinal epithelium was different 2,000 years ago than it is now? No, it was not. Soft tissues have always been the same. 
Nobody's born that way. It's not natural. It's dangerous. Talk to homosexuals that have been saved who the Lord has set free. It's always the same story. An absent or missing father figure was a lesbian, an absent or missing mother figure. Daddy was mommy, mommy was daddy. A gender identity crisis in early childhood that screws up their thinking when they get into adolescence. It's always the same story. Every one of them who have ever heard give their testimony. Everybody I know who Jesus has set free from that. And bearing in mind, when I was a teenager, I was strung out on cocaine. I don't think that their sin is any worse than mine. And my, my sin would put me in the same hell as theirs if the Lord didn't have mercy on me as well. But everybody I know who Jesus has set free from that lifestyle, and I have plenty of friends in New York who are that. Everyone has the same testimony. Every one of them. But now we have churches dodging the issue like Hillsong or endorsing it like Steve Chalk, like Cliff Richards. I met him once at a Christian artist meeting in New York. Nice guy. Now he said about five years ago, four years ago, the church has to change its position. I wonder why he said that. Quite a thing. The growing remnant. has adopted and will hold a biblical worldview. The shrinking majority will not. They will do what Colossians warns us not to do. They will adopt the vain philosophies of the world. They'll think like the world. They'll reconstruct theologies based on the world's philosophies and try to make it appear to be Christian. Liberals have been, theological liberals have been doing that for decades and decades. But now evangelicals are doing it. It was done by the post-Nicene church fathers who were Platonists. It was done in the Dark Ages, early Renaissance. It was done by the followers of Thomas Aquinas, who were Aristotelians. It's always been done, but not by truly saved people. Now it's being done by people who claim to be truly saved. The growing remnant will have a concept of the church that is relational. Our relationship with God through Christ by the Holy Spirit. And then, after our vertical relationship with God through Christ by the Holy Spirit, our horizontal relationships with each other in Christ by the Holy Spirit, having one spirit. The concept and structure of the church will be relational.
the shrinking majority it'll be institutional the body life of the growing remnant will be something which is Holy Spirit led and biblically or scripturally grounded. This relates back to spirit and truth to a degree or in part. The body life of the harlot church of the shrinking majority will be programmatic forty days of purpose catching the fire get on board with the latest move of God get the program All you need is the right software package for your PC and you'll get the results you want. That's what they think. And of course, much of this becomes based on marketing. The growing remnant will consist of Christians and fellowships who are historically aware. As Martin Lloyd-Jones said, if we do not learn the lessons of church history, we are doomed to repeat its mistakes and failures. If you remember the teaching we did some time ago, nothing new under the sun. We looked at groups like the Quakers and the Irvingites and the Shakers, all the stuff they're doing now, they think it's new. Not knowing that which has been is that which will be, that which has been done is that which will be done. There's nothing new under the sun. They repeat the mistakes of history because they don't no history. They don't even know the word of God. And they don't know the history of those who deviate from it. Why are those silly, ignorant people believing in that stupid garbage in Wales? Can't you see that was the same as you had in Pensacola? Well, can't you see that was the same as you had in Toronto? They're not, they don't remember. They don't know what happened last week. I remember the old time Pentecostals when this nonsense began. They said that was A. A. Allen who died drunk 40 years ago. He had the palm oil in his hand. They said this was William Branham. This was Kenyon. We know what this stuff is. This is the Manifest Sons, Latter day Reign. The old time pennies of the 1940s rejected this stuff as crazy. Now they're making it mainstream. The remnant will always have a sense of history. The others are doomed 
to repeat errors, the errors of the past. As we warned about several years ago, we studied Isaiah 28 and 29. The faithful church, the growing remnant, their entire perspective is Christocentric. They're focused on the Lord Jesus. His word. The shrinking majority are ecclesial centric. They're focused on the church at least their version of the church. They're focused on the club. Auto-deluded and satanically deceived into thinking they are building the kingdom of God, they are simply erecting the empires of men that will not and cannot stand. All goes to Babylon. That's quite a list, isn't it? Take your eyes off Jesus. That's all it takes. Put the Bible down. That's all it takes. Quench the spirit. That's all it takes. Adopt the vain philosophies of the world. One is going to go that way. One is going to be that way. The growing remnant, the shrinking majority. Those who are Christocentric, those who are not. I'd like to leave you with one thing. Turn with me, please, to Romans 16. Verse 17, Romans 16, 17. Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eyes on those who cause dissensions and hindrances, that is, stumbling, contrary to the teaching which you learned and turn away from them. Some versions translate this, mark a factious man. Jacob Prash is divisive. He's factious. He's bringing division. Keep away from him. Well, let me tell you what it says. What it really says. Divisive. Dissensions.
The term is dikostasia. Same Greek prefix is where we get dichotomy. A fork in the road. The road straight ahead is rather narrow. But at some point, a broad road that is wider branches off. The way we should be going is on the narrow way. A few people do. But when you see this Broadway, it's very tempting. So the majority of the people in fact, the overwhelming majority of the people decide to take it. They go a different way. There's a dichotomy. These guys will go in the way they always went. Who has divided? the ones who stayed on the same road or the ones who branched off onto the broad road. Obviously, it's the ones who got off the road they had been on and took another road that was wider, more appealing in some human sense. Who divided? Obviously, it was the ones who left the road of orthodoxy and who went to heterodoxy who divided. Those who no longer believe what they once did. Yet because they are the majority, they accuse those who have not divided of being divisive. You understand the way the lie works? They accuse the ones who have not divided of being the divisive ones. Because they have the numbers and the loudest voice. What do you mean we haven't divided? We believe that Jesus took our sin. And it's wrong to say he didn't. And if you say he didn't die in our place and that God is a child abuser, you've left the truth. Oh, you're divisive. You're judging your brother. He made them male and female and said it was good. Same-sex marriage is unnatural. It's a oh, you're divisive. You're judging your brother's... You understand what's happened? Now they may be too ignorant to understand this and the ones who do understand it are compromising with it anyway because it runs by theocratic politics now. That's what it's going to be. The growing remnant 
or the shrinking majority. They have no life in them, you understand. They will spiritually self-destruct, ultimately they will numerically decline, and then they'll be regathered into some kind of a Babylonian confederation for the Antichrist. This is going to happen to them. Is it going to be Logos or Plastios Logos? Exegesis or asegesis, spirit and truth or a choice of two evils, neomontanism or cessationism? Is it going to be understanding God's purpose for Israel and the Jews or replacementism? Unity of the spirit or ecumenism and interfaith idolatry? Is it going to be the gospel of propitiation or a different gospel? Is it going to be the monogenes or another Christ? Is morality absolute or is it relative? Is it a biblical worldview or the philosophies of the world? Is the church relational or institutional? Is it Holy Spirit led and biblically grounded or programmatic body life? Is it a church that's historically aware or it's doomed because it is ignorant of history and doesn't want to know anyhow? Is it Christocentric? That is the reality. That's the way it is. The growing remnant or the shrinking majority. God bless.